Howdy folks, my name is Jack Potter. I am here to talk about physical social engineering and other just assorted physical security things. Uh, for those of you who have seen my physical security talks before, this one's different because now I actually work in the field and I'm not just ripping off other people's conference talks, so that's kind of fun. Uh, I graduated here with a degree in cybersecurity engineering like a year or two ago or something, whatever. Uh, I've been working in security for about three years in total between full-time work, internships, stuff like that. Um, uh, about a year and a half of that, I've been able to not focus on physical security and social engineering, but definitely do a f more than my fair share of it, uh, mostly because if you work on a cybersecurity pen testing team and they find out that that's what you like to do, you just kind of get pigeonholed pretty early because a lot of people don't like having to make phone calls and lie to people on the phone. Uh, but there's job security in it, so it's cool. Uh, I used to be the chief soapboxer here. Officially, I think I was the vice president of something or other. I was never actually the president. I just kind of like held a coup and just made Cole sit down while I talked over him most meetings, so uh, that's me. Uh, I put exactly one picture here to make it look like I'm a real human being, and that picture is of me holding a bicycle because I like to bike. Uh, jumping into what we'll be talking about today, I'm going to go over a little interview, uh, uh, overview of physical security, uh, specifically through the lens of what does physical security testing look like if you are working in the field. You know, like, I, I can't speak from the blue team side of things. I can just talk about you know, what is it like to actually be on a physical pen testing team. Uh, because there's more to it than just you know, show up, pick the lock, and collect a paycheck. Uh, Going to be talking about social engineering techniques, uh, just some of the ways that myself and my coworkers have found ourselves taking selfies in other people's server rooms by just simply asking, which is kind of fun. Uh, some just assorted physical security tips that are just kind of fun and I felt like throwing in here. And this is going to be punctuated with anecdotes from uh, actual things that I have done and seen done in the field and that I can fairly confidently say will work. Uh, but obviously first, as with any security talk, standard disclaimers, uh, this is my talk, not my employers, etc. Uh, this is for educational purposes. If you break into a building, don't mention my name or IASG's name, uh, and don't use this to break into a building, preferably. That'd be good. Um, and this information is a mix of my experiences and then some other people's work and research. Uh, so I can't speak to you know, uh, guaranteeing that all the tips, tricks, and techniques in here will work for everybody all the time always, but they've worked for me in the past, so I've compiled them here to share. Uh, so just a quick little overview of physical security. What, uh, what, what are we trying to accomplish when we're testing a system's physical security? What is the, you know, the blue team trying to accomplish? Uh, you know, what is physical security for them? Uh, essentially, for those of you who've had any security or networking class, uh, the CIA triad, just quick hands up if people have heard this term before. I'm sure you've all heard it in one of Julie's classes. For those of you who haven't heard it, the CIA triad is confidentiality, integrity, and availability, basically the three things that anybody is trying to maintain in a you know, computer system or network typically. Uh, but in our case, uh, you're trying to guarantee those things uh, in meat space. Uh, how do you keep you know, confidential data uh, inside the bank server room and not you know, out on the internet uh, via the way of somebody just walking in and stealing a hard drive? Um, essentially, you know, that's and the, the fun bit of my job is getting to be the one to walk in and try and steal that hard drive. Uh, pen testing is not equivalent to a red team. Uh, by the way, I, I should, I'm going to interrupt myself here real quick. At any point, if you have a question, please like yell at me or raise your hand or something. Uh, I will just otherwise talk possibly without taking a breath for the next like 60 minutes. So please interrupt me as soon as you have uh, any sort of question or want any sort of clarification. Also, these thoughts are kind of just scattered in here at random because I know how I tend to talk. But uh, pen testing not equal to a red team. Uh, I've been on physicals for red teams and for uh, just a lot of physical pen tests, you have pretty different goals with both of them. Uh, with a physical pen test, you're just trying to show a proof of concept of some sort of violation of that CIA triad, right? You want to show, hey, I could get into your server room, that's a problem. Or, hey, I could access some records room where confidential information is held. Or, I could, you know, f I found an office with an unlocked computer in it, that's a problem. Um, but you're not actually trying to go steal the hard drive or run away with a bunch of patients' medical history or get on the CEO's computer and do something evil. Uh, you're just getting in there, documenting how you did it, what could happen, demonstrate some kind of business impact. Uh, in and out in you know an hour. Uh, physical red teams, you're actually you know you're out there. You're doing the the fun things of trying to sneak in, sneak in very stealthily or talk your way in either or. But you're actually in there to plug stuff into the wall and get on their network and you know escalate to domain admin from inside their in a, a conference room in the client office or something. Uh, 
Um, you're not just trying to show a, a proof of concept. So red teams tend to have a much broader scope and allow you to do some more interesting things, uh, but there's still quite a few limitations that are going to restrict what you can and can't do, uh, both on these red teams and on physicals. Also, social engineering, basically always 100% of the time involved. I have yet to find a client who is interested in just somebody coming out and saying, someone could throw a rock through your window and get into your office. That's a finding. Or, hey, I picked the lock on this door and let myself in at midnight and grabbed a hard drive while the police were, you know, running to the scene because I tripped an alarm. That's still a finding. They don't care about that. The real thing that people want to, ha to have tested is, you know, how their employees respond to a, uh, a physical intruder of some kind. But there is still, you know, some, there's a time and place for the fun gadgets and badge cloning and sneaking around at night and things like that. Uh, to get into some of these testing limitations, there's, these are always going to exist both for red teams and uh, just standard pen tests. But you've obviously got, first and foremost, your client requests and the firm policies. You know, if my company tells me I'm not allowed to go do something or that the client has specifically requested that I do something, that tends to be goal number one or restriction number one. Uh, there's also legal restrictions in place and then just objective reality uh, that comes into play at some points, annoyingly enough. Uh, with client requests, there might be rules about they only want certain offices tested. Uh, you have to make sure you're the right one. Uh, I was on a, a test in the last two months where there were two clients, uh, we'll call them uh, Acme Contracting and Acme Contractors, two very similar sounding names, uh, and their offices were literally right next to each other. I'm talking, you could touch both offices if you stood in between them and T-posed. And uh, they are not the same company. They are not owned by the same company. They are legally distinct entities. I had permission to break into Acme Contractors, but if I touch the door of Acme Contracting, trespassing charge. That's a problem. Uh, so make sure you're at the right office, and both for you know the correct company and that you know if the client has one specific uh, office in mind, don't go break into some other office of theirs and say, well, you know, I was able to get in elsewhere. They, you know, got to follow their, their rules. They also have their preferred entry methods. You know, some clients will specifically want you to try and uh, s just walk right past security, walk past reception, just try not to talk to anybody, see it, how long it takes for someone to stop you. Uh, there are also clients who want to see if you can just BS your way through and just talk to people and get them to invite you in or bring you somewhere that you shouldn't be allowed. Um, so that's uh, something that does come up. Uh, and then when are you actually allowed to do the testing? I've had clients who make it very clear that they don't want me anywhere near the building around the time or after the building closes uh, because they don't want people to get suspicious or they don't want people to get nervous that they see me out at their remote campus uh, and they see someone that shouldn't be there and escalate things to the police or to someone deciding to be a hero and pull a gun on me or something. Uh, so if the, if the client says don't touch it uh, after this time, you, it's in your best interest to listen to them. Uh, there's also firm policies. Uh, you know, you've got how many hours are you actually allowed to spend on this? Uh, so if I'm on a pen test, I'm, you know, I'm on a pen test next week, a physical pen test where I have a grand total of, I think, four hours to do two locations, which means I don't have a whole lot of time to try and sneak in, hang out in the bathroom, you know, wait till I'm sure that the people who may have seen me come in have left, go sneak into a conference room somewhere, hang out there for an hour. You know, it's just, I've got an hour to show up, uh, look around, see if there's any uh, interesting way in, and then realistically just follow someone through the door, or walk in and say I'm a contractor or something. But, you know, you don't have you know, weeks on end to prepare some really elaborate ruse and set up all kinds of fancy things. Uh, you just have to kind of show up and go for it. Uh, there's also, you know, limits on what uh, tools are acceptable. I've had my boss uh, tell me a number of times that, you know, despite my uh, continued requests, we're still not allowed to pick locks in most situations. Kind of boring, but whatever. Uh, then there's liability things. Uh, don't be picking their locks because we don't want to break their locks. Also, don't climb up on the roof to try and sneak in through a roof access door because if they do not want to risk me falling off a roof, which makes sense. Again, boring, but it turns out that a lot of physical pen testing and red teaming is not exactly like it tends to look in conference talks where it's you know, a bunch of people doing some James Bond stuff and you know, rappelling up or down the side of a building or something. Uh, also, legal limitations tend to be a thing. Uh, hands up if you are familiar with the coal fire incident. I'm hoping this is, okay, cool. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there was a wonderful, fun time had by a couple of testers for the security firm Coal Fire. They were contracted by the state of Iowa to test a number of buildings that ostensibly belong to the state judicial system. One of those included the Dallas County Courthouse in Dallas County, Iowa. And 
there's a whole lot of shenanigans that go into this, but the long story short is that they got arrested and there was a really long protracted deal of the sheriff not wanting to drop charges against them when he caught them inside the Dallas County Courthouse after midnight or something. And you know, the, the, the primary crux of the issue was that the sheriff contended that he had jurisdiction over the Dallas County Courthouse and the state of Iowa did not have the authorization to send someone to break in. Uh, so after that, that, you know, that has really informed the way that I interact with all of my clients, setting things up for physical pen tests and red team engagements. Mostly, I want to make sure that anybody who could have a, any possible stake in me being in that building is informed and aware of what's going on. So if that client is renting an office from someone, I want their, you know, their landlord and building management to be involved. If they have an alarm system that's going to phone out to the police if I you know, walk through the wrong door at the wrong time, I want local law enforcement to just have been given a heads up that, hey, if this happens on this date between these hours, maybe don't you know, shoot first, ask questions later. It's probably just the test. Um, yeah, essentially don't get coal fired, which uh, if it isn't a verb yet, I'm declaring it a verb. Uh, yeah, don't get arrested. Yes? Have you ever had problems with like the front desk being more suspicious of people because now building management has passed along the fact that uh, so that is the interesting, you know, intersection of, you know, there, there's a, a dichotomy there, right, of you can't tell everyone, hey, this is just a test to let the dude in because that kind of ruins the point of the test. Uh, so I've seen this as, uh, you know, resolved in a couple different ways. I have one coworker who, uh, when they wanted him to go, you know, wa uh, walk into a couple different bank branches, they actually informed the f one person at the front desk of each bank, hey, let this person in. or. I don't know, it was a bank back offices, I'm sorry, it was, it was back office areas for a bank. Uh, they were told to let the individual in because they just wanted to see how long it took for someone to stop them from doing whatever suspicious thing they were up to. Uh, I've also run into times where they just said, you know, we, building management knows and you know, the, your standard one or two client contacts in IT know what's going on, but nobody else does. Um, one very important thing that I should mention is, you know, if, if you're going to ever be involved in this, the most important thing in the world to you is your get out of jail free card, your letter of authorization signed by the client with client names and phone numbers so they can call whatever C level is aware of the test and verify that this is, you know, acceptable and to let you go. Um, it, it, there is definitely some discussion to be had about how many people should be made aware of the testing going on. Um, so, you know, on, my, on a recent red team, uh, on the one where it was, you know, Acme contracting, Acme contractors, we asked about, you know, informing if, there, if there's building security or building management that could be informed just because we didn't want to, you know, run the risk of just some shenanigans there leading to problems. Um, and what we ended up not telling anybody at the building just because uh, they uh, own the building themselves, they aren't renting it, uh, they didn't have... Uh, or their alarm system, or I think they, they may have uh, contacted the alarm company, but it didn't go straight to the police, so uh, they were made aware. Um, but yeah, you, you know, where is that balance of you want to test people but not you know, get the police called on you? It's definitely something that's going to be a per-client basis. Uh, let's just talk about a bunch of social engineering techniques, speaking of awkward transitions. Uh, so what not to do? Don't just show up unprepared. Uh, Everybody, I'm sure, has seen or may heard a reference to the videos of people on YouTube taking a ladder and just trying to walk into, you know, anywhere. That kind of works. Don't expect it to work. Um, having props, wonderful, helps a lot. Turns out a lot of like bank managers are way more suspicious than you would expect. Uh, and a ladder does not mean that you are prepared. You also can't just show up with you know, a toolbox and a fake work order that says, look, your address is right here. I'm supposed to be let into the server room. People get suspicious. They want to make phone calls. They want to find out exactly who you are, why you're here, and who actually sent you. Um, do not plan on sticking to a script. This is very much an improv kind of game. Uh, if you go in expecting to have just, you know, the, there's this, you, you, you've planned on what dialogue is going to happen between you and the receptionist, and then you think you're home free, I think again. That just very much is not how things ever work out. A lot of thinking on your feet, a lot of just improvising a reason for why someone just caught me in his office chair, a lot of trying to figure out, why, yes, that is a good question. Why am I in the server room right now? Let me think of a reason to tell you. You know, you, you, it helps to have one or two you know, ideas just in the back of your mind, but don't plot out this whole grand dialogue of how things are supposed to go. 
Uh, do not expect to be able to tailgate everywhere. Uh, if you haven't heard the term, tailgating is the wonderfully easy uh, technique of just following someone through a locked door when they open it. You know, they badge themselves in, they, they walk in, maybe they even hold the door for you. Uh, it works. It works frequently. It does not work everywhere. It's pretty situational. One thing that I have found in my experience, I'm going to, I made a whole slide about this that I'm going to talk to you about later. Never mind. Uh, finally, don't go in having only a single pretext. Uh, you know, don't walk in expect it, or don't show up to the client site thinking, you know, the one thing that I'm going to need to say is that I'm from their internet service provider and I'm here to work on, uh, you know, I've got to apply some updates to their cable modem and check on a couple of things in their server room and that'll be good to go. There's a, you know, I've had a, one of my coworkers showed up to a bank to, with that as his plan, saying that he was from the ISP, or saying that he was planning on saying that he was from their ISP and that he needed to, you know, go fix their fire modem or something. Uh, and when he arrived at the bank, there was a Comcast van already outside because Comcast was already there doing work that day, which cool, hilarious, fun coincidence. Good luck telling the receptionist, I'm with the Comcast guy and having you know her not just you know ask him, hey, did your partner find where you need to go? And then this becomes a whole thing. Uh, so when he when he showed up and the van was already there, he had to improvise. He decided you know he's got uh, a toolbox and this fake this fake work order that he printed out. He went changed some things up. Said he's an electrician. Found I think he put together just a uh, a little electrician disguise with or disguise. He f he found a uh, shirt that looks vaguely more like a work shirt in the back of his car or something and just went for it. And that ended up working out for him, but it's definitely a, uh, like I said with the don't stick to a script, have a, you know, one or two plans ready to go because the universe will intervene in fun ways. Uh, what to do when you're breaking into a building, again, with permission, with authorization, I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but seriously, don't go get arrested. Uh, obviously, do plan ahead. Uh, this can look like, this can take a lot of different forms. Uh, one of my things that I always do, look at your target on uh, Google Street View. You want to find out where the entrances and exits are. Is there a back door where there's uh, you know, a little picnic table and a, uh, not an ashtray, the, the cigarette butt disposal tower thing, you know what I'm talking about. If there's one of those, looks like there's a spot where employees go out and take a smoke break, there's a very real chance you could hang out out there and then just tailgate the smokers in if it's a big enough office and there's a chance they wouldn't recognize you. Um, maybe you see that they have a uh, you know, some big courtyard. Uh, you know, it's, it's a uh, you know a, a, a campus of offices that all belong to the same company. Maybe there's you know a, a great place to go hang out, look like you're eating lunch, follow somebody into the building. You know, just looking at it ahead of time like that really helpful. Also gives you a sense of once you get into the building, your heart's going to be racing. If you you get past reception. You don't want to have to think about, hmm, where do I need to go? You don't want to be standing there looking confused because if you're you know, a technician or something there to do work, you should probably know where you're going. So it's helpful if you can figure out the basic layout of the building ahead of time, show up, sound confident, walk right where you need to go, get to work. Um, develop multiple pretexts that make sense. Uh, you know, if you don't show up in the middle of winter and say that you're from some pest control thing when all of the bugs around the building have been dead for three months because it's you know, winter in Iowa. Uh, don't show up and say that you're from uh, Comcast if you know they you aren't sure that they use Comcast or something. Uh, especially, you know, one thing that I've found to be helpful is just uh, identify myself from a fake company that I say is just a contractor with a couple different internet service providers. That makes it a little easier than you know if I if I'm not sure whether they use you know Comcast, AT and T, whatever. Uh, finally, bring the appropriate props. Maybe that does include a ladder. If, if, if that is appropriate for your pretext, then by all means, but again, don't, don't bank on that being its only, it's the whole thing. Uh, some potential pretexts that uh, I have found to be pretty great for getting into buildings. Uh, t vendor technicians are my bread and butter. That is the usual that gets you in, doesn't get you a whole lot of questions. Um, can be a little bit high risk, high reward, because if you get if they decide no, there isn't supposed to be a technician on site today, and they decide, nah, we're gonna have you leave and come back once we've figured this out, you're you're kinda done. But if you can convince them that you are there to work on the network, to work on electrical systems, to work on something, you have the keys to the kingdom and they'll let you in anywhere. Um, so vendor technicians, ten out of ten. Love it. Uh, employee from another office, this works pretty well as well. Uh, my one of my coworkers and I spent 
a, uh, in retrospect, disturbing amount of time stalking uh, one specific guy from Kansas City for uh, in our hotel room while we were on site for a red team, just so that we could call up the uh, office that we were there to break into and say, you know, hey, I'm flying in from Kansas City to other city with uh, with my wife tonight to go visit her family. I was hoping that tomorrow I could actually come work uh, in your guys' office instead of just working from her parents' house. And that kind of worked. He, we, we knew everything about this John Doe. We knew everything about when he and his wife got married. Again, it was a disturbing amount of stalking, and in retrospect, kind of weird. But hey, uh, if you, you, you just called him up as this guy and just says, hey, I need, uh, you guys got any uh, extra cubicles, offices, somewhere that I can just come sit down and do some work tomorrow or for the next, you know, for the rest of the week, by all means, come on in. Um, you can also just show up and say, you know, hey, I'm from another office, but that can be a, a gamble. Um, also, client or vendor who is visiting for a meeting, after spending many hours preparing for a physical red team, ended up getting into the conference room by walking in saying, hey, I have a meeting with Ryan today. Uh, the receptionist says, oh, I don't think Ryan's in today. I say, oh, no, I, he just texted me. He, he said he, he just got in. It's fine. I'll just, I know my way. I'll, I'll see myself there. She goes, oh, okay. And I just walk on by and then, you know, walk and barricade myself in a conference room and plug into a network. And there you go. Bob's your uncle. Uh, just you're there on site for a meeting. Uh, on the same red team, uh, one of my coworkers just knocked on a side door that had a sign on it that said, you know, don't come in this door, go around to the front, check in with the receptionist. But he just knocks on the side door, somebody opens the door and he says, hey, I was just here for a meeting with John, left my keys in the conference room, can I go grab them real quick? And he's like, oh yeah, by all means. And so he just walks right in. And now you're in their conference room, you're plugged into their network, you win. Uh, turns out, people are trusting and, you know, a lot of people show up at offices for meetings. Now again, all of these, everything in this, super situational. If it's a tiny office that doesn't have a lot of outside vendors or clients coming in for meetings, maybe that doesn't make sense. If it's uh, you know, some office where all of the uh, like internet and electrical stuff is handled by building maintenance because they're in some big office tower, maybe the vendor pretext doesn't make sense. It's very much a you know, figure out your client, figure out your target, figure out what actually uh, would be logical for that situation. Uh, when you're picking out an outfit to show up in, pretty easy. Technician, polo shirt, work shirt, jeans. Um, bonus points if you have a shirt that has a company logo of some kind on it. Um, I'm not recommending this, but if you happen to, if any, who here's done the uh, the cyber defense competitions? Most of you, I'm assuming. You know the yellow polos, the gold polos that white team shows up in the day of. Just gold polo says Ice Age right there. Turns out that looks like every single IT company's polo ever. And if you happen to have one of those, again, not recommending you do this, and I'm not saying I've done this, but if you show up and say you're from Ice Age Technology Consulting, you look the part. And people are going to say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Have you signed into the guest book as Ice Age? And there you go. Um, bonus points, uh, like I said. Oh, there's also, uh, I've uh, got some coworkers who were on a red team assessment. They found that their target company has a web store where you can buy merch with their logos and stuff on it. They just bought a shirt with, you know, an, an Acme contracting polo shirt, showed up wearing jeans in that polo, and they're like, oh, yes, you are obviously an employee here, and nobody asked any questions. Turns out, uh, you know, the, if you want to take the time and money to invest in putting a, together a uniform like that, works pretty well. Otherwise, I just have a long sleeve gray shirt, jeans, boots, carry a toolbox, put uh, my ham radio handheld on my belt, walk in, say I'm an electrician, cable technician, whatever. You look the part, people will go for it. Um, and as an employee, just dress like other employees. That, that, yeah, I mean, you know, it's pretty, pretty easy. Um, you know, you could bring a tie, and then if people aren't wearing ties, don't, you know, take the tie off. And, and you know, pretty straightforward. You dress, dress, dress like everybody else. Alternatively, dress slightly, be just slightly better than everybody else, so you look just important enough that nobody wants to mess with you because they don't recognize you. But if you're the only one wearing a suit jacket, you're probably maybe important. I don't know. I don't want to tell you to get out. What if you're a director visiting from out of town? It's worked for me in the past. Um, let's talk some more about uh, other th ways, uh, just other techniques here. Uh, your phone, super useful. This is something that my coworker and I, uh, who I mentioned on, I think, the first slide, or I didn't mention, but his name's on the first slide. We'll talk about him more later. He and I have spent a little while developing something of a methodology for using phone calls to get into buildings in pretty straightforward ways. Uh, essentially, it consists of the really complicated technique of calling the building and saying to let you in, uh, and that's about it. Um, 
if you call ahead, this is something that I've used before. Uh, anybody here ever heard of Spoof Card? Does that mean anything to anybody here? Wonderful little app, lets you uh, spoof phone numbers. Uh, if, you haven't, if you're not familiar, look up just caller ID spoofing. Turns out every single system that we rely on on a daily basis is just held together with like chewing gum and duct tape and nothing, like it's all garbage. Uh, caller ID is no exception. Super trivial to spoof your phone number. Uh, if you want, you can take the time to set up a VoIP server in AWS, and now you have just unlimited free spoof calls wherever you want. Or you can get the app and spend like a dollar per minute per call. Um, and it's, you know, lets you call anybody with any number you want. So uh, you call the uh, satellite office with the main office number, or even better if you can find the phone number for some executive. Uh, and just say, uh, for the call ahead one, you just call in and say, hey, this is you know, John Smith over in the head office. Uh, you know, preferably John Smith is somebody from IT or facilities or something. Uh, and you say, uh, yeah, we've got a technician coming out to your location today to work on the network, to work on, to do electrical work. Maybe there's a storm recently. We're sending somebody out to look at the uninterrupted power supplies and uh, backup batteries in the basement. I've, I've used that one before. There were storms uh, that week, called up two different bank branches uh, back to back and just said, hey, uh, we're sending out an electrician. Uh, he was going, we, didn't, we were planning on having him come out and do regular maintenance next month, but with the storms, uh, just figured we'd have him come check out, make sure that you know, no fuses have blown, no uh, UPS batteries are having any problems. And then when I show up dressed as an electrician and just ask, hey, uh, I'm supposed to be working on the UPS systems in the server room, they go, oh yeah, we got a call, you're supposed to be here. Uh, high risk, high reward, uh, if it works, you're golden, no one will ask you any questions, you win. They just have you sign in and you can go wherever you want. Uh, if it doesn't work, you have burned yourself before you show up. If they try and call that person back to validate this, or if they send out some mass, e they send out an email to their branch. Uh, I got really lucky with this. The person I called at the first bank branch actually did say, would you like me to just send out an email to everyone and say that there's an electrician coming in today? I said, absolutely, yes, that would be super helpful. Then after hanging up, I realized, shit, if she CCs me on that email, then John Smith is gonna find out that he just ordered an electrician to come out when he certainly did no such thing. That's a problem. Um, Fortunately, she didn't CC John Smith. I showed up, the, person, the first person I talked to at the desk recognized, you know, when I said I was the electrician, they said they saw the email about it, had me sign in, and that's all there is to it. Um, but yeah, high risk, high reward calling ahead. Yes? More or less. So essentially for a lot of physical pen testing they just they don't want it to become a big protracted thing of you're saying no i'm totally allowed to be here and trying to like force your way back in or something uh it's just once somebody does call you out you can say cool this is how long it took like you can try and convince them a little bit but uh you know and again this is situational based on the client and what they're going for and just the general vibes you're getting from that person like if i try and just tell you no i'm definitely supposed to be here go call this person and then get back to whatever you're doing are they gonna, do they seem like someone who's about to call the police and make a problem for you? Maybe in that case you pull out your magic get out of jail free letter, say, okay, I'm actually from a you know, security testing company, I'm supposed to be here. You caught me, you win, good job, I'm going home. Um, on red teams, it can be a little bit more dynamic. One thing that is, that, that has been allowed on red teams before, and I'm a very mixed feelings about it, is fake letters of authorization, uh, where you just show up to your red team with a fake, well, you have your regular letter of authorization, but then you have a fake one as well, and this fake one just says, hey, you caught the tester, good job, you're the best at security, let them go to the conference room and hang out and do the rest of their network pen test now, please, you win a $50 gift card for being the best at security, and then people go, wow, that's awesome, all right, I'll show you guys to the conference room, and then you plug into the network and you win. Um, I'm a very mixed feelings about that. On one hand, super funny, super cool, you know, everyone, that's great. On the other, that is kind of like, I don't want to erode whatever trusts like the general public might have in these letters because that letter has more than once been the only thing between me and getting like the police called on me. So I don't want like bank employees to go, hmm, you know, I heard on the news or I heard from a friend that these letters are fake because you know, you're actually still trying to get on our network and I'm going to go push the red button that summons lights and sirens. So, I don't know. Typically, once somebody says, no, we don't think that you're supposed to be here, you're gonna have to leave, that's the point where I'll pull the letter and just, you know, peacefully walk out. Um, but if you, you know, maybe, 
uh, you know, depending on the situation, you might call back your client contact and say, hey, I got got right away by reception or something. Uh, do you want to let them know what's going on, tell them not to tell everybody, and then have me go back in and try to just see how long it takes someone else to call me out? Or see if I can just tailgate people in through the front door, how many people will just let me do that? Or something like that. And, you know, that can change based on what they want to do. But options exist. So, yeah, typically it, as soon as someone gives me like real resistance, that's when I'm out. But, you know, I'll, I'll spend a while trying to convince them. But once it becomes clear that that's not going anywhere and we're going to have a problem, the uh, letter comes out, I go home. Uh, anyway, jumping back into the call stuff, uh, the validation calls are uh, what we have found to be the magical, easy way into a large number of offices. Uh, and that is you just have a co-conspirator on the outside who you have told is you've prepped them as, you know, I'm just going to keep using John Smith, the IT director or facilities director or whatever, the CIO of the uh, Acme Corp. Uh, and they are just prepared to either, uh, they're prepared to pick up the phone and pretend to be John Smith and say, yes, we ordered this technician to come out or yes, I'm the supervisor for this employee. He's on site with you guys today or whatever. Uh, and you can approach this in a couple different ways. Uh, we've done it where my coworker has called me on his way into a building, and then as he's walking in, he's saying, hey, John, yep, I just arrived on site. Uh, yep, I'm walking up to reception now. Hey, I'm from wherever. Uh, John told me that I'm supposed to come in and do this thing. Uh, and then frequently, they'll, take the, they'll just take the phone and assume that it is, in fact, John Smith on the other end of the line and have a conversation. My coworker, or I, I say, you know, let him in, and they, they let my coworker in. Uh, you can also provide a number for them to call, which is just your coworker's phone number or your co-conspirator's phone number, um, which has worked for me uh, a number of times actually, a like more than once. Which it's the first time I thought it was cool, but might have been a fluke. I also just realized my laptop is about to die, so excuse me while I plug this in. Um, it's uh, the first time I thought it might be a fluke. Uh, second time, uh, and every time after that, it's an established pattern. Uh, you can just say John Smith told me to come in. Um, and then provide the phone number for John Smith. Uh, easiest way to do that, you have a contact card set up on your phone that just has the John Smith name and the, your co-conspirator's phone number. Just have that ready to go in your pocket. As soon as they start getting, the receptionist starts getting suspicious, saying, I need to call and make sure that this is legitimate, you just slide your phone across. Either they pick up and call, or they just type that number into their desk phone. Either way, it's worked more than once. And I am pretty fond of using that as a technique. I have also had people call me out on it, and correctly, they know to not just accept the random phone number. They should look it up in their telephone directory in Outlook or something, and then call the actual uh, CIO. But uh, it turns out you can just provide a phone number, and somebody's already in that headspace of, I need to get the number for John Smith. I am going to call John Smith. Oh, look, the phone number for John Smith. And it just kind of short circuits, and they go for it. Uh, finally, you can have your co-conspirator call in, which, you know, pretty much the same deal. Uh, this has worked for me before where just as I was walking in, functions similar to the call ahead where my coworker just calls in and says, yep, we've got an electrician coming out today. Just let him in. And, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, I think he's just arriving here now. How convenient. Um, uh, also have tried to use that as a last ditch effort of they're about to kick me out and I just text him call now uh, from under the desk or something and just hope that when like they get the phone call they answer he says hey I just uh, sent a, I, my technician supposed to be getting there anytime can you let him in uh, maybe it'll get you out of a jam who knows um, anyway phones are your friend use them um, General tips for other social engineering interaction, or just other social engineering tips for your interactions on your way in. Uh, the right kind of confidence. I know it's a kind of weird statement. But like everyone says the confidence is key for social engineering. They're right, but you, it's it's weird. Like a, a lot of people seem to think that it's going to be this grand performance. Like you've got to be, you know, you're on a stage putting on a show as this character that you're playing. It's really just another day at work. Like you don't, you might not like walk like a. You know, you're not trying to walk around like you're the king of the world when you're walking into class or walking into work every day because it's just another day. You just kind of look like, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to be here. Obviously, I'm supposed to be here. I'm at work. I'm doing my job. Um, and you want to sound that way, too. Like, you don't want to sound like you're, you know, super thrilled to be here. Oh, my God, I love coming out to bank sites to help work on the cable modem. But you also don't want to sound like you're, you know, mad that you're there. It's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm here to do my job. 
your job now is to let me in so I can do my work. Um, you know, it's a hard kind of energy to just describe, but you know, it's there, there's it's just the I don't know. The, 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 Most people have had that energy before. Yeah, yeah. It's it, any time that you've ever had to, you know, show up for class. At basically, yeah. Nine a.m. or something. It's just like I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm indifferent about being here, but I'm here, so let's do this. Um, also, be polite. You don't want to be sucking up to people and try and get them to fall in love with you so that they'll let you go do whatever. But also, just be nice, and people tend to reciprocate and let you. You know, if you're, you know, kind to them, they'll, you know, not be annoying when you try and walk past their desk into the restricted part of the office. Um, people do like to be helpful. Um, so if you, you know, if, if you make it seem like it's a collaborative eff collaborative effort of the two of you trying to, you know, go get this electrical issue solved or get this network issue solved, then they'll like to help you into the, con into the uh, conference room you need to be in or the server room you need to be in or something. Uh, and finally, once you're in there, look busy. Uh, that applies no matter how you get in. You could follow someone in. You could talk your way in. You could sneak in through a roof hatch. Just once you're inside, look busy. And most people don't want to deal with the awkwardness of coming up and saying, who are you and what are you doing here? Uh, most people just see that you're at work doing something, and they'll let you go. Um, and that can, you can look like you're doing literally anything. I've walked around a bank just holding my laptop in one hand with a coil of Ethernet cable around my arm. I can't remember if I had a Wi-Fi antenna in my hand or not, but I was just walking around like just looking like this, like I'm looking around for something really important, like I'm, tr I don't know, sweeping the place for bugs or something. And I just kept walking past people's offices. I ducked my head and just, and then keep on going. People are, okay, he's busy. He's doing something. I don't know what the hell he's doing, but he's doing something and I'm not going to interrupt him. And it, it, it works. Um, you know, you don't want to just stand around looking like, you know, well, where should I go break into next? Just keep, keep doing something. Uh, tailgating stuff. Like I said earlier, very situational, super great when it works. Don't count on it working all the time. My general rule of thumb, the larger the office is, and by that I mean the more people in the office uh, on a daily basis, the easier time you will have tailgating. It's basically because, you know, when I'm trying to get into a credit union that has one manager, three tellers, and maybe like a loan officer on any given day. It's really hard for me to follow one of those people into an office pretending to be one of their four coworkers because I'm not one of their four coworkers. It just doesn't work. Uh, if it's a big office, like you know some Fortune 100 thing where they've got you know, a couple hundred people showing up to work every day, it is a lot easier to just kind of walk up with a group of people getting there at 8 a.m. or getting back from lunch, just kind of keep your head down and walk in with the pack. Um, one thing that I have done uh, is you know you keep just I, I've got a uh, RFID badge that I use to get into my office every day. Uh, it has it doesn't have my picture on it, doesn't have my name on it. It's just a blank white RFID badge. Just, you know, if everyone's throwing it by the scanner as they walk by, I found a, a, a weird number of those uh, RFID badge scanners make the same noise for a badge accepted read and a badge failed read or a badge not accepted read. So you just, it'll still beep. You just walk by and just bzzz and keep going and people will assume you're with the pack. And that's if you even need to get the badge out near the, near the reader. A lot of the time, if there's a big group walking in, you can just walk in. Uh, also, if it's a lar if it, it is easier to walk, walk in with large groups, uh, then it is to just follow a single individual. That's when people, you know, if they aren't if they aren't already aware of you and they're, you know, maybe they'll hold the door or something. But if you're just trying to sneak in right behind them as the door is closing, that's when they tend to turn around and go, "Hey, wait, what are you doing here?" Um, other things that can work uh, tricks that I have seen work before the uh, the heavy box. You just you're carrying a large box that's actually full of air and uh, nothing else, but you just look like you're struggling to carry it. People hold the door for you. Um, I have uh, one of my old coworkers kept a really oh god what was it? it was like the box that either a sur like a big like three U rack mounted hardware thing came I don't even remember what it was just some giant uh, some really big server that was I can't remember which one it was but just a, a large box he just kept it forever and whenever he had to go do a physical walk in and just brought the box with him and more times than not he just looks like he's struggling to carry this big awkward thing people would be lining up to hold the doors for him so that he can get to the server room to install the server or something uh, also food delivery if you show up with a box of donuts nobody wants to be the one who turned away the guy with donuts um, that's just yeah you, you don't want to uh, you don't want to do that um, uh, and then yeah just wearing a badge that doesn't need to have anything doesn't need to look anything like their badges you know, to an extent but if you just have a badge on your waist 
people will, be, will assume that you are supposed to be there. Um, tailgating is definitely, oh yeah, uh, man traps, stuff like that where you've got, you know, you, things like turnstiles where you have to badge to move the turnstile or the big ones where you're basically trapped in a little airlock and, you know, you need, you, one person at a time can get in and badge, a uh, badge is required to get through it to the other side. Those make tailgating problematic. I haven't seen them in a lot of places. Usually, the, I mean, the only places I have seen them have been in places that also did uh, manufacturing things on site. Uh, and I don't know why that's just been the trend, but I haven't seen a whole lot of them. Uh, badge access elevators, those get annoying. Um, had to deal with that once or twice where basically your only option is to tailgate somebody else onto the elevator. Um, there do exist elevator keys and such, which I'm sure some of you may have seen from other conference talks and things. Uh, I would highly discourage you from just putting keys into elevators and trying to access the fire control panel and going to where you want to go. Totally can. Uh, like, due to fire code, that badge is not actually required to get to that floor. The key will override it and get you there. But you're probably going to have a problem once you get there. Um, I just don't recommend it. Don't mess with elevators. Don't, don't do it. Um, and finally, tailgating, uh, great stuff, but combine it with another pretext. Like you could use it you know, maybe once to get into the building, and then after that, you've got another pretext ready to go in case people ask you what's going on. Or you talk your way past reception, then use uh, uh, tech, uh, tailgating to get into a more secured part of the office. Done that to get from, you know, I've, I've talked to my, or I've just walked in past reception, gotten into a bank office, and then ended up use, uh, tailgating somebody into their IT office, which was supposed to require badge access. And, you know, at which point I find that the only unlocked computer workstations I found in the entire building were in the IT office. One of them was the machine they used to write uh, to image new laptops for employees. So couldn't do anything at all with access to a machine like that. That would be, you know, nothing. Um, so, yeah, just combining it with something else tends to do some good things. Uh, finally, we're in the bit where I just threw together uh, a couple of my thoughts because I figured, yep, I would ramble forever. I've been talking for like 45 minutes. I'm just going to jump through a few fun physical security tips, tricks, other things real fast. Uh, gadgets. Everybody loves them. They're cool. They're flashy. They're fun. They make fun noises. You can say, look at this. I have a tool that'll let me get into like a door that I'm not supposed to be able to get into. Uh, there's a lot of testing limitations that end up preventing those from being super useful all the time. Mostly, either firm policy or what the client is expecting. Uh, that being said, they can be useful at times. Uh, this was a very, f this was from a red team where uh, my coworker and I just decided to both bring our large bags of all of the gadgets we could bring and all and more that we had to expense with us just so that we could have all the fun things, which consisted of things like an underdoor tool, uh, a Raspberry Pi that was going to call back to our servers if it was plugged into their network. Uh, let's see, USBs for a USB drop, a USB rubber ducky, uh, some long range Wi-Fi antennas, ham radio for listening in on their security guards uh, radios, uh, a Proxmark for cloning badges, blank RFID badges for then writing uh, badge data to, uh, clipboard, because that's a great prop for just walking into places. Um, let's see, a polo that may or may not have a nice little logo that looks like a company thing on it, uh, a polo that has a fake TSA badge on it because that just makes it look like a generic mall security guard, uh, which looks like most building security guards, generic work shirt, camouflage because I really wanted to sneak around at night, got to do it, didn't need to have it, but damn it was fun. Um, a, a spotting scope, which we ended up using because we parked a ways away from the building and just trying to look at employees to figure out what kind of badges they had. and. Uh, how, you know, how many were coming and going at the lunch hour and stuff. The only thing we ended up using was the spotting scope and the long range Wi-Fi antenna. Oh, and the camouflage, but that was, you know, super not necessary. Um, super fun stuff. Highly recommend learning to play around with like RFID stuff with a Proxmark or something, because I guarantee that will end up coming in handy on red teams in the future. Uh, this client just didn't really happen to use badges much at all. You didn't need them to get into the building, so just didn't really care at that point. But uh, fun stuff. Underdoor tools, neat, not super useful. For those, if you don't know, uh, the underdoor tools that you know, long piece of semi-flexible metal that then has a wire on it. Basically, sneak it underneath a door up to a handle, much like that door handle there. Uh, it just kind of wraps around the backside of it. Then you pull on the wire, bends the metal, pulls the door handle, lets you open the door from the inside. Uh, there also exist things like double door tools, which just stick in through a double door, grab onto the thumb turn on the deadbolt, and then just let you rotate it to unlock the door, stuff like that. Fun stuff. Um, not super common in my line of work. Now, admittedly, 
my company mostly does physical pen tests and fewer physical red teams. So if you manage to get on a physical red teaming team, maybe you would end up using these things way more often. But for me, most of it's just showing up and pretending to be a technician or an employee from another office. Uh, let's see, access to a building after hours. Uh, picking external locks, difficult, usually not allowed. Uh, bypassing external locks, easier, still not usually allowed, but if it is, Cool, go for it. Uh, there are alarm systems, though, out there, so you know, be careful about that. Uh, SEing your way in and then hiding out till after hours, probably the easiest. Just you know, get in however you want and then hang out in a bathroom or a conference room. Uh, setting up Wi-Fi attacks from the outside, free. Show up, point a Wi-Fi antenna at the building, do a you know, mess with it. Uh, do whatever shenanigans you're supposed to do for your red team. Also, uh, don't lock this door notes. Um, they're stupid but they're hilarious. I've never done one, but uh, I, I have family who used to work in banking. They knew of a local, like not a large bank, but a, like a reasonably sized bank branch where uh, two individuals wanted to take all of the interesting contents of the bank. Uh, their way of doing this was walking in uh, in the middle of the day and just slapping a note up on the door, that, on the inside of the door that said, please do not lock this door tonight. Maintenance will be coming in to work on the whatever management or they put like somebody's the manager's name because they knew the manager was out of town that day, um, and then they left. And then the tellers closed up the bank, and they did not lock the front door. And so the two guys showed up, walked in, grabbed everything they could, uh, and left. Which, admittedly, not a ton because I think most banks like throw everything in a, like their actual like vault or safe or something overnight. But there's still something in the registers, and you know, not great to have people in your bank when you don't think anybody's in the bank. Um, so, you know, turns out some of the really simple stuff like that can work. Uh, let's see, rec sensors, the canned air trick. Uh, I'm just trying to fly through this now because like, I've kept you guys for too long at this point. Uh, canned air is the, f the, hands up if you've heard of this, rec sensor, canned air things, wonderful. Rec sensors are the wonderful thing that makes it so that when you walk towards the inside of a door that's locked, uh, you know, if you're on the inside of a building walking to an external door that is usually locked to the outside, uh, or walking out of a server room or something that's usually locked to the outside. The rec sensor is a little box right above the door that's using infrared uh, or ultrasonic or something, in or usually infrared, in order to see if there's a human moving at the door. If there's a human moving at the door, it unlocks the door. Um, turns out you turn canned air upside down, spray out a ca uh, just like that cloud of cold gas. Uh, tricks infrared sensors into thinking, huh, there's a temperature differential on the other side of this door. I'm assuming that humans are involved somehow, and it unlocks the door. Um, more modern rec sensors are apparently less susceptible to that. I don't know. Uh, the one time that I thought I was going to have a chance to use, a, use this, I ended up getting caught before I could do it, and I was a little disappointed because I'd taken the time to smuggle canned air into the building in a monster can, but whatever. Um, uh, elevator keys, uh, you, according to fire code, fireman's key will get you anywhere you want on an elevator, but also don't do that because if you don't know what you're doing, probably going to cause a problem. Uh, common keys for alarm and electronic lock boxes. Uh, 16120 key is my favorite. I forgot to bring my fun key ring this evening, but I just have a key ring of uh, common cabinet keys. Uh, the 16120 key is the one that opens. If you've ever seen, there's a bunch of them around Ames. Uh, Door King Systems is the brand that makes a lot of alarm and uh, external electronic lock boxes. Uh, the kind of thing that you might see on an apartment building or office building where it has maybe an intercom into the security desk, uh, a little panel where you can type in a PIN number, and then a RFID reader so you can swipe a badge to unlock the door. Uh, they, every single one of these boxes ships with the same key that you can use to open the box to do maintenance, uh, at which point you just push the override all button inside and it just unlocks the door and lets you walk right in. Uh, search for Deviant on YouTube. He's phenomenal. My previous security talk was, or like physical security talks, were just ripping off all of his stuff. Um, the dude is just a, a legend in the field for a reason, uh, and he has some great videos on how to do this stuff. Actually, no, no, I'm not going to do it. Oh, God, I hit the button. Hang on. I'm just going to keep running this. Oh, God. You can see that we really know what we're doing here. Uh, all right. Um, Oh, cool, excellent. That's the end of it anyway. Uh, look for Deviant on YouTube. Uh, Kevin Mitnick's The Art of Deception, really great book, just about all the times he called somebody up and said, let me into your building, or fax me a copy of this sensitive data, and they just did it. Fun stuff. Uh, has some fun ideas for pretexts. 
Um, special thanks to Max, he's my coworker, who uh, he and I have done a lot of collaboration on getting each other into buildings via a phone call uh, on the other's behalf, which is a lot of fun. Um, always makes my day more interesting when he asks if I'm you know, free for an hour around one o'clock to play a character and sends a LinkedIn profile of who I am going to be playing that day. Uh, and it ten usually, like more often than not, it works to just you know, pick up the phone and say, yes, I am in fact Joe Smith and you do in fact need to let Max into the building so he can work on whatever. Uh, if you want to ask me questions, send me hate mail, whatever, uh, hit me up on Keybase. Uh, I rarely ever install Twitter. Uh, or I, 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 you know, reinstall it, use it for a week, realize I hate it, delete it. Uh, I'm pretty active on Keybase though, or email me. I will respond to those things. Um, that is the extent of the presentation. I did have the uh, presence of mind to download a copy of Deviant's cool, uh, just a 30 second video showing how one would uh, bypass the Door King boxes with the 16120 key. So I'm just gonna play that because it's 30 seconds and well worth seeing. Um, it does not have any audio because, uh, as I told some people earlier, my laptop's audio died under mysterious circumstances, or at least the 3.5 millimeter jack did. Um, anyway, that's the Door King Systems box. You have probably seen those around Ames. If you haven't seen them around Ames, you will start seeing them everywhere around Ames. A lot of apartments use those, a lot of offices use those. There's like two brands of these boxes out there. Door King is really popular. Uh, 16120 keys are also $10 online. Just Fun fact. Um, anyway, uh, you can see there is one lock right here that is meant to be replaced uh, by the building security for the building it's uh, installed on. Uh, that lock is usually like a, you know, in like a, a best lock, an American lock, like just some good quality lock. Usually six pins, security pins. I don't know. I I can't speak to what they typically are. Just that if security is going to be installing a new lock there, probably a decent lock. But the one at the very top of the box. Uh, that is how you open the box for maintenance, is just always the same terrible key that's $10 on every one of these boxes by default. You open it up, there's a little override button, you push the button, you close the box, no one ever knows you were there, and now the door is open. Um, pretty insanely straightforward. Uh, highly recommend not just doing that to random buildings because that's what we call crimes, and we are like have agreed that we're not going to do that. But if you ever happen to be on a red team and they happen to have one of those, $10 lets you in any time of the day or night, and you're free to go. Um, yeah, that is essentially my whirlwind thing of uh, physical security nonsense. Um, 